Welcome, Mingyur Rinpoche. Thank you so much for being with us today. I loved your book uh, so much. It was for me one of the one of the best spiritual autobiographies that I've ever read. And I'd just like to ask you, what was the culture shock like for you moving into the world uh, in that way for the first time? Can you describe what the experience was like for you and what it shifted in your perspective? Yes, I was born in right middle of the Himalaya mountain. So it's in Nepal. So we have um, highest mountain, um, Manasilo, world at highest mountain in the world. So we have very nice kind of like a village and the village tradition, the language, spiritual and the culture, everything just like Tibet, it's a border near the Tibet. So when I was young, I don't have so much interaction with the, the outside world. Of course, sometimes I come down to Kathmandu, which is the, the biggest city of Nepal. And I, will, I see many foreign students of my father. So my father was a great meditation teacher. And then I see some, the, the modern world on the TV photos, books, I thought, wow, might be like God ran. <laughs> and then, of course, I, I learned meditation from my father and I went to India near Dharamsala. And I studied under the Vajadara, Taisi Rinpoche, Salji Rinpoche. So great. I am fortunate to learn great teachers. And then I finished three year retreat. I finished my also formal Buddhist college for nine years. Then I began to travel abroad. So, you know, I went to the big monument and there's everywhere it looked like very, this was in my book, you know, some kind of net very high. And they said it's a safety. Sometimes people are very unhappy and my danger might happen from here. I thought, why is unhappy? Mm. Everything look good. So when I discuss more and I try to teach also meditation and I have to do a lot of interview, then I found suffering is everywhere. <laughs> what I call monkey mind. So crazy monkey mind is international, doesn't matter in my village or the most advanced material advanced city mm. or most simple city everywhere is the same thing. So that the first journey was quite shocked to see that, but Eventually, I understood what Buddha said. Yeah, I mentioned in, in my book, this is my latest book, uh, In Love with the World, the name of the book. So when I was um, young, although I was in village, but uh, I was born in the very good, uh, nice family in the village. So everybody respect my family and people treat me very well. And then I moved to the monastery and I have the title as Rinpoche, so it's kind of like a special reincarnated, special name for me. So I have responsibility, but at the same time, people treat me very well. So normally what I call, I'm kind of like Dharma Prince. I never stay alone without a student or attendance before. But at the same time, there's a lot of life stories in the Tibet, like great Milareba, the yogi, the wandering yogi who left everything behind and freely travel everywhere and experiencing the ups and downs of life. So that really kind of like inspired me. So when I was young, my mother used to read those life stories in my hometown in the evenings getting cold. So we all together around the fire and we drink soup in the evening. So then my mom began to read those life stories. So sometimes my grandma will cry and I cry and all of us cry. So that was really in my mind. So then, although I was in the uh, move into India in the monastery. Life is good. Everything's wonderful. But I have this urge to really want to do kind of like wandering retreat. Everything left behind. So then, since 2000, I was very busy teaching. 
teaching many places around the world. A lot of students. I have monastery in Buddha Gaya, here in Nepal, in Tibet. I become abbot, wrote a book, and become kind of a bestseller. So then I, in 2011, I decided to leave everything. And I, I was there in my monastery in Buddha Gaya. So I left my, my monastery in the night, you know, I, <laughs> I would keep one key, the main gate, big key. So when I left the monastery, there's a gap, the mind, although physically some kind of a lot of sensation and cannot really describe, kind of everything become like illusory. Mm. For a while, it's a big kind of like, like something peel up. But very happy that I can make it. So then I start to go to the train journey in India. That time train is not so well. Now it's really improved. And so then it's very difficult, actually. My dream, kind of naive, you know, I'm, you know, because I'm in in the good life circumstances, I'm in that state before, but suddenly come out. So, a lot of sufferings. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Then, yeah. then what really helped me is the, the practice, the, the meditation, the Dharma. And that really helps the ups and downs and all this. I'm alone there, there's no friends, and I have a few thousand Indian rubies. There's also mm. gone in the end, no shelter, nothing in the end on the street. But the Dharma has really give me courage. The meditation practice really give me strength. And what I see now is I really learn two things. One is um, about the light, and second is the inner transformation from this practice. So, mm. That was one of the my one of the best time of my life. Yeah, Rinpoche, did you have panic attacks in the beginning? I remember that you had something that, that you described as anxiety, severe anxiety. Yeah. Was it like was it like the panic attacks that you had had as a child? Yeah, I had panic attacks when I was young. So that one is a very long time. Sometimes you cannot sleep and the heart beat. You know really become strong and sweat. But when I live in my monastery, there's a fear. But at the same time, the good thing that I have this meditation practice is with me. Then after three weeks later, I have a few thousand rupees. I'm spending buy a new train and buy some sadhu clothes and stay in the what do we call this uh, dharamsala? It's very cheap, kind of like guest house, broken guest house. All this gone. After three weeks later, then I'm on the street alone. I never back anything before. So I thought I will try with somebody I know because I have some money on the street. There's a small kind of like restaurant. So the owner knows me. So I went there to back leftover food. So I eat, eat that leftover food. Then I have diarrhea i didn't put poison or something vomiting yeah. diarrhea yeah. fever for five days so then end of the five days then i thought oh maybe i'm going to die so then panic can live oh. very strong around 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 2 p.m a little bit tight here and not the same as when i was young but this time it's just a lot of, of course the fear with the reason when I was young, many of them are really, ex not really reality exaggerated. But now, of course, real. I'm there on the street, going to die. <laughs> so the the panic is quite strong that time. So after five days later, I cannot move. Even I cannot stand up now. I cannot look for even water also. All the my body is uh, now dysfunction. So then I thought, should I go back, back to monastery <laughs> or just let it be like that way? If I want to go back, then I, I thought, how should I, you know, I need to call 
So I see the, the guards has cell phone, some people has phone. Maybe I can ask them, yeah, maybe. I'm kind of ready in my mind. If I want to go, I can ask them to call. But then there's one practice that is kind of mind training practice that let it die better, be die. Uh -huh. Let it live, be, give me the courage to live. Somehow I decided to let it be. Around 2 p.m., I have very strong fear. About two hours, very strong anxiety, panic. Then after I decided let it be like that, then the, the anxiety is gone. Mm -hmm. Now very relaxed, whole body is kind of blissful. <laughs> and these were experiences you could not have had at the monastery. Was this the most intense fear that you had experienced in your life? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. this is the... If I'm in the monastery, I never experienced that. Maybe when I really going to die, maybe I may experience Otherwise, Normally we learn a lot about the death and dying practice, death and dying meditation. I learned this from the books. I learned this from my teacher and I reflect that and we all practice that. But we never know whether all these states are true or what will happen. Mm. But the moment, in that Kushinagar, when I almost died, I experienced all this, what we call dissolution of element. So first, of course, my body become decayed and slowly, slowly, I cannot see here. Body become paralyzed. Mm. And then there's experience of element dissolution, like falling, oh. floating, melting. Uh, burning, then blow away, and then dark, cannot see anything now, cannot see, cannot hear. Then, normally what we call, end of that, we all experience the mind of the luminosity, meaning in that moment, the conceptual mind totally dissolved. And the sense of body, outside phenomena, also dissolved, so no subject, no object. So the six consciousness were dissolved. Then what happened is the luminous mind, what we call the mind beyond subject and object, mind beyond concept, the awareness that is there with us. So if we know we're going to experience that and we have to practice, get familiar with that. Right now, we have the practice of that. Mm. Then what we call, we will achieve enlightenment, full enlightenment. Mm. So I had that experience in that moment. So first, after the five element dissolution, become dark. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, maybe I'm going to become unconscious. Almost unconscious. Then total open in that moment. Mm. Mm. No front, no back, no up, no down. And the awareness is so present, so clear. But that awareness doesn't have the word. Right now, when we think of something that's image, then the chatting the word and the sensation, three mixed together, none of those are there. Mm. But at the same time, kind of like knows everything. Like when when we go into the mountain, sometimes we see pristine lake, right? And in that lake, entire valley and mountain can reflect into the lake. It's not the lake go out, but everything is came in. Mm. So that kind of like experience that the luminosity is so vast. Mm. And, yeah. I was just going to ask Rinpoche, has that, uh, has that, um, is that still with you, that, that liberation that you experienced through that near-death experience? Did that permanently shift your awareness? That big change for my practice after that. So I am really appreciate that, that wonderful experience that I had. Although it is um, really kind of dangerous. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, recommending other people, don't do that. Don't try <laughs> at home, you know. <laughs> Rinpoche, I'd like to ask you about rebirth and reincarnation. There's, that's a, there's a distinction between those two things that most people aren't familiar with. 
I know in the West, we have a lot of trouble with the idea of reincarnation. Years ago, I asked Sogyal Rinpoche about it. And what he said to me is that the wisdom mind reincarnates. It's not that the biography reincarnates. Could you say something about rebirth and reincarnation, particularly for people who have trouble with the idea of that kind of return? So, oh, what reincarnate actually? As I mentioned, this uh, luminous mind, the, um, our fundamental nature like sky, and that cannot be die. Why? It is unborn. In order to die, you have to be born for being born first. Mm. Then you will die. If you are unborn, how you can die? If there's no beginning, how you can have end? If it doesn't exist, how you can make destroy? Mm. So this luminous mind never going to die. But this is empty, unborn, yet not nothing. So many people misunderstand about emptiness. People think emptiness is nothing, void, mm -hmm. you know, scared. But actually, it has this luminous mind. So the, the end of the dissolution, end of the death, we experience that lumina luminosity. That is the, the nature of that, who we are. There, there is clarity. Although, it may not have subject and object like now. So that luminosity, we are not recognized normally. And what happened? We are lost in the thought, emotion, feeling. So we have become very small. So normally we have what we call five uh, aggregates. Body is the, the matter aggregates. Then we are feeling. The feeling, the emotional mind, very important. Everybody looking for happiness. Don't want to suffer. Nobody don't want, nobody wants to suffer. So that feeling, sensation level, third, aggregates. Then the cognitive, the intellectual mind, the grasping. Then number four, unconscious mind, habitual mind. Mm. And all these four comes together on the consciousness, stream of consciousness, what we call. Mm -hmm. And that stream of consciousness goes on, goes on, goes on with a different body, different body, different body, because the nature is the, the empty with the clarity, empty with the luminosity, they cannot die. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then it, with the illusion body, illusion mind, Goes on, goes on, goes on with the cause and condition, cause and condition, cause and condition. That's what we call uh, rebirth, actually. Actually, rebirth is also just like dream. Getting old is like dream. Good news, no? <laughs> <laughs> Die, also dream. Good news. Death is like dream, actually. But if you're not fully recognized nature of that death and dying, what we call four rivers of suffering, being born, sick, getting old, sick, and die. Mm. So this is also illusion, just like dream. So in the dream, if we have pizza, although dream pizza is not real pizza, but we can make pizza in the dream, has a lot of cause and condition we need it, you know, oven, then whatever the cheese or powder and the heat, and then pizza is coming. Mm, now you can eat pizza. Oh, that pizza is dying now. <laughs> Although there's no real pizza, but not nothing. Appear as pizza. As appear as pizza, but it is not exist. So that is what we call emptiness. So actually, death and dying just like that. But when we not fully recognize that, then it will continue. And how do we explain people who remember things from past lives? How is that? How, how would you uh, approach, you know, explaining that to people who don't aren't familiar with these levels of consciousness? So that stay in the stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the, the five skanda first four, they get together on the stream of consciousness, the last one. So people remember past. And also some people sense future also. 
And it may come in the dream also. When we sleep, we are go into the subconscious mind. So that steam, stream of consciousness has that whatever going to explain tomorrow. The seed is there, mm. sleeping, not wake up yet. So some people experience future now. Or some people have senses. Many people have normally. So this sense of past, sense of future, normally most people have that. Mm. Even the intellectual, we cannot believe. We cannot explain, but the intuition level always there. So the dream and the sleeping is the, as I mentioned before, there's a six bardo, so three bardo connected with the lifetime now. So the dreaming and sleeping, these are the one of them. So this is really important. So normally, sometimes we analyze dream but not judge, just analyze and let it be and let it go also. And some, the one, the dream meditation, one of the main practice of the dream meditation is lucid dream. Mm -hmm. We try to recognize while we are sleeping. Once we recognize our dream in the dream, when we have lucid dream, then we are free actually. We don't need to follow dream rule. We are free of dream rule. We can fly, jump into ocean, and without sink, mm -hmm. jump into fire, will not burn, but, but dream will not disappear. Mm. So that is the, what we call example of the recognition of emptiness. When we recognize everything's emptiness, the phenomena will not disappear. But what disappear is your grasping. The grasping, it's like a net, you know, spider net. So whatever touch that and you trap in that. So we trap in this, um, what we call samsara, samsara meaning the circle of suffering because of the grasping. But when we fully recognize emptiness, samsara may not disappear. Pizza, no need to disappear. Still you can eat pizza. No problem. So therefore the dreaming is same as the second bardo that I mentioned before, the plan B. Plan B, we become unconscious, then we wake up. Then we see a lot of lights and the, the, we see the phenomena, everything. We see our friends and family, everything. In that moment, the most important, oh, you need to recognize I'm dead. This is a bardo. Mm. Then you can meditate, very easy. If you don't know where you are, if you don't know you're in the bardo, then you go on again. The mind stream will lead you again and again to the next whatever departure that you will go. Mm. But how to break that? Oh, recognize. So the sleep, the dream is really also powerful because when, when we experience in the dream right now, normally in the text said, if we have lucid dream seven times in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Then we will recognize plan B, the, the second part of, we will recognize that. Mm -hmm. Then another is sleeping. Sleeping is very similar as the first part of that part of moment of dying, as I mentioned, the dissolution that what, what I experienced, you know. So when we go to sleep, we all experience subtle level of this resolution. So maybe some people, when they go to sleep, feeling like falling. Any of you feel falling when you go to sleep? Mm -hmm. Some people feel like melting. So falling is earth element dissolution. Melting mm -hmm. is water element dissolution. Mm -hmm. Then shock, some people get like burning or shock. That is the fire mm -hmm. element dissolution. Then the Fourth is, then this is very subtle. You blown away. So air element. Then last is space element. Then become dark in that moment. So that moment, you're, you cannot see, you cannot hear. The, the mind is go inward. Then, then after that, a split second that we feel very peaceful. That luminosity mind will appear when we go to sleep. So sometimes 
you are in the boring meeting, so you don't want to sleep, but then you cannot uh -huh. control you. Go, uh, almost got to sleep and then you wake up. What happened? <laughs> you will really feel very fresh. Yeah. So in that moment, what happened? You touch to that luminous mind and come out. Mm. So it feels so fresh. Everything's like kind of like new world, fresh world. But then if you sleep a long time, it may not happen. Right. Rinpoche, I'd just like to change uh, gears a little bit and ask you about the teachings in the West. How is it for you uh, as a teacher working with Western students versus Eastern students? Is there a discernible difference in the way that they take on the teachings and your job uh, as a Rinpoche guiding them through this process? Yeah, so normally what I experienced is the, um, the you know, sometimes I get a lot of questions and I encourage our student, if there's time, ask question. So from the, my question, what I get is, uh, if I come to the, like America, North, South, little bit similar people, a lot of people ask what I felt, what I sense this. So beginning of question, a lot of kind of fail or sense like that. And when I teach in Europe, the question comes of what I thought, what I think. <laughs> and when I teach in Asia, how many? Tell me what to do. What is next? <laughs> <laughs> they want advice. I've heard Asian teachers say that Americans tend to work much harder. They tend to be sort of more industrious about their practice. Is that is that an experience for you? Yes, sir. I think different type. Americans uh, really want to know exactly how many, and then the once the teacher give whatever homework and try take very serious and to follow that. I was really talking about spiritual materialism when I was talking about the difference between the West and the East and setting up enlightenment as another goal, as another consumer goal. Uh, is that mm -hmm. something that you recommend having enlightenment as a goal or does that reduce our practice and make it a more egotistical pursuit? Yeah, this is very important. So what we call, um, we need to find balance. So let go, what we call letting go is very important. Be present right now, right here. Don't look future too much. Let go of the past. Let go of the future. And, and accept the reality as it is they are right now. But now is important for the future, actually. <laughs> So that is the uh, let go. But letting go is not giving up also. Mm -hmm. If you give up, then there, there will be nothing. Mm -hmm. So you will not make any effort. You will not do anything. So of course, in the, in the Buddhist, we talk about enlightenment. Enlightenment is something to achieve. And why you want to achieve that, to benefit for beings? others so there is a motivation love and compassion and that love compassion buddhist has some kind of goal some kind of way some kind of path but at the same time accept whatever happened the reality patient present being present and follow the flow of the nature is really important so in a way one way let go of the goal be now present. And when you let go of goal, be present, and that is the enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> so normally in the meditation guideline, what we call, you need to look for cave, which is relatively safe, not very danger animal around, not some kind of cliff where you may fall or the river or something. And then another important is dry inside, dry cave. Nearby, there's a stream of, of water. 
water nearby. Mm. And you're going to pick up some dry wood, a branch and uh, something. And then the, not the busy entrance, you know, people are passing through always quiet place. So these are the normally recommendation. And, and these camps are there a lot in the Himalaya mountains. In the past, there's a lot of meditators, many meditators will meditate there. But the most of these caves, caves are, they have some wall there actually, not really door, not really window, it's half it's empty, but air is coming. And we can make some wood, the door, like wood, one wood put like the one wood, cross wood, we have to make it. And uh, so normally the caves is um, not belong to anybody, actually, no private ownership, those caves, whoever want to go there and do practice, they can do practice. Normally what we call is the first when we learn meditation, we should stay in a retreat center or the, the kind of safe place, uh, maybe colleagues of the meditator or maybe teacher nearby. So what we call, it's like when you make the um, fire. So when we make first fire, have to have the protection from the big winds and movements and the dry wood, all this put together and tiny fire may begin to burn the tiny woods. Uh, so that is the, the beginning stage of the retreat and meditation practice. When the fire becomes bigger, then you open the protection. Let wind blow and let whatever wood you can throw in. So then eventually adding wood to the fire, meaning all the whatever obstacles, problems, anything become support for your practice. So then the cave comes in that moment. So cave doesn't have any particular boundary there, no protection, no particular people come serve for you, make time, this is your lunch, nothing. So actually it's a wild in the mountain. Mm -hmm. But the one thing is uh, it's very fresh nature and no busyness of the world. So we, we can go more inward, more concentration and more detachment, but the others is the a lot of struggle there also. You have to survive, you have to for food, you have to, there's no toilet of course, there's no really kitchen there. And then uh -huh. you have to look everything by yourself and you have to bag the food around. So a lot of challenge there. So this also helps to, to improve the practice. Mm. I'd like to bring up a, an uncomfortable subject, which has to do with sexual scandals uh, and spiritual teachers. Can you give us your sense of why there is such prevalence of sexual uh, misconduct and abuse uh, in, in spiritual communities? And what can be done about that? Yeah, I think the important people, what they do is they're taking the name of the spiritual and people use the sometimes wrong way. So although sometimes people enter the practice, but the mind cannot totally transform. Mm -hmm. So the most, I think important is the, sometimes many people ask me about what you can do. So what I'm saying is the really important is we have to use great example we try to really do from our own aspect what what we can do what we can show the examples mm. what we can uh, participate in our own small level i think this is really important and what about the necessity uh, for a spiritual teacher to do his or her own emotional work uh, in order to prepare that one can be an excellent meditator, but may have a lot of neurotic tendencies or power yeah. issues? Do you think it's right. important for a spiritual teacher to do that kind of emotional, psychological work on him or herself? Yeah, I think it's really important. So sometimes what we call the absolute practice and the relative practice cannot match together. So for an absolute level, maybe you might have some experience, 
not fully realized maybe, but then from relative level, how your practice need to match with the, your own habit, your own emotional, your own problem, and then transform it, these things mixed together. So sometimes what people, even the long meditator, even you meditate, practice a long time, doesn't matter who you are, any practitioners may have this problem. So what we call shooting arrow to the east, but the, the target is in the west. So you leave target in the west and putting shooting arrow in the east. So then they, they are not kind of like become antidote of your own problem. So view and the meditation need to apply with application, the conduct, mm. the behavior. So I think it's really important. And is that a part of your, your tradition, that, that inner work that uh, coincides with the spiritual work? Is that a part of your preparation as a Rinpoche? Yeah, yeah. So this is really important. So what we call three things, view, meditation, application. Mm -hmm. But these three things has to be together. So now after I come, come back from my retreat, so now I'm really emphasized about these three together. So almost every teaching, I try to bring this view, meditation, application together. So view begin with the intellectual mind, cognitive. And meditation working with the experiential mind, the feeling level of mind. And application is the habitual level of mind, the, the unconscious mind. So without these three together, then sometime, the, even though you learn a lot of practice, then you, you may not easy to transform. Yeah, yeah I think the, the traditional, we have this feedback system. So what we call the true uh, supporter or feedback individuals you have to look for. First, your teacher, of course. Second is, your dharma brothers and sisters mm -hmm. meaning the the one who practice together same as you like you have received some teachings not may not be at the same time but the individual so look for one of those especially if you have more close connection mm -hmm. and then ask them about the, my training how is my my bodhicitta my buddhist action my Wow, my samaya, whatever my, how I communicate with the, uh, the helping other beings, whatever. So, ask them to remind, and the teacher sometimes may not be available all the time, but uh, this dhamma brother and sister will be available. But um, nowadays these traditions are lost, especially in the modern. Everybody is everywhere, so there's an, the ecosystem is I think lost. So then a lot of kind of individual and solo and special people who come to the meditation, they don't want to take any friends. <laughs> I remember the night, great story about Maizumi Roshi uh, who had a drinking problem and his students went to him and said, we really think that this is an issue, uh, Roshi. And he went to I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous. So he really he was open to that kind of feedback. Uh, and I, I was moved by how come about the humility that he right. showed in hearing yeah. that and taking action. Yeah, yeah, I think this is really important. Wonderful. In the last few minutes that we have, Rinpoche, I just wanted to ask you about the Buddhism of the future. Uh, do you see Buddhism as an evolving uh, philosophy? And what do you see as the Buddhism of the future as the East and the West become more uh more joined and everything uh, is is so much more uh, synthesized do you how will uh, buddhism change do you think moving forward of course the buddhism the style of the teaching it may change it depend on the personality the what buddha said uh, mentality personality and then culture whatever the 
the situation in that time, Dharma has to curb with that, has to walk with that. So the meaning of Dharma is that what Buddha teach according to level of culture, uh, personality, family, the mind, whatever. So it may change, of course, but the essence of Dharma is, is universal. So awareness, love and compassion, and the wisdom. So these three is the essence of the Dharma. That I think it may form different ways, but it may we no need to change. If that changes, then Dharma loses meaning. So Buddha said, has to keep these th these important things. Mm -hmm. For example, when I come first time in California and I teach about the loving kindness, compassion, and this example, if you develop loving kindness, compassion, all the virtue quality will develop like summer river and everybody mm -hmm. summer river in california like, summer river is become dry and less 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 so india and nepal has monsoon so we have big flourish summer river so all these are need to change <laughs> will science and the neuroscience revolution affect buddhist practice and the way that people approach uh, the work I think that now, because I'm also really uh, interested in science, so what I learned from science so far now, there's no really contradiction. And in the way, what Buddha is saying is from different angle, but what science is saying, a lot of things, another angle. So saying the same thing to explore nature of reality. So I think in the future, the Buddhist special the buddhist these practice are really important for the future world because as the material development very fast and at the same time there's a lot of things coming from the outside circumstances but then we need to really how to transform the inner the, the how to connect with awareness love and compassion wisdom i think this is really important otherwise we will have a lot of side effect from this material things we right now we are having a lot of people having depression like me panic stress is a big problem and all this the problem which is we don't know how to transform for the path for the long long time in Buddhism, we have all this great practice, very detailed level, very experiential level, very kind of transformative practice there. So I think this will be really beneficial, I think, in the future. Thank you so much for being with us. It's great to meet you. And uh, I just want to wish you every luck. And I hope to meet you in person someday. And very interesting conversation. So I'm very glad to have a conversation with you today. Thank you.